Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, June 1st, 2024. And our top story today, the market sell-off continues. And joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Jane King is joining us from the NASDAQ. Jane, so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Great to be here again, Jeffrey. So last week we talked about a market plunge, and I'm going to illustrate it with like this. And and this week, the market sell-off continues, dot, dot, yeah, dot. So yeah. what can you tell us about this? Well, especially with the Dow. So it feels like we've had a few unique situations. So Salesforce was a problem Thursday. Uh, they missed their earnings for the first time in uh, since 2006. So the stock was way down. They had their worst day in 20 years. Salesforce is one of the 30 companies that makes the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So that weighed on things Thursday. And then there was just this general sense about we've gone from, oh, we're going to get six interest rate cuts to maybe one. <laughs> So we've kind of we've kind of morphed into that. I would say over the past I don't know month to six weeks or something, and that's in the market as well. Um, and you know we may start seeing some kind of uncertainty about the election uh, that could be coming in also. So um, we get an inflation number on Friday that was as expected. So a little relief there. So a lot of mixed signals. Does look like uh, we'll have a positive month of May though. Yeah, and and I think you had warned us or told us historically. I think we were. On average, uh, S and P was going to return, I don't know, forty percent. This is like months and months ago, and here we are, year to date. Yes. I think the S and P, as of I think the 29th, was ten point four percent. Still a really good number. If I could get ten point four percent for my money every year, Jane, I, I would love that. People would love that. So yeah, I mean, it's actually for this year hasn't been doing too bad, but the second quarter has been kind of you know we we had a little bit of a screeching halt early on, and still recovering, I think. Yeah, and 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 you know everyone's so focused on forty thousand, and we we'll get we get so fixated on on these like things. You know, yeah. they become memes now, and yeah, they yeah. become like hey, let's just get folks fixated on that. Yeah. Uh, Jane, you mentioned inflation, a positive inflation number. How about oil, gasoline? Still a lot of conflict in the in the Middle East. Uh, that seems to be in perpetuity, by the way, for 70, 80 years. So that doesn't yeah. seem to be going away but but oil gasoline where do we stand there yeah so we do have an opec meeting this weekend they're not expected to make any changes to um i was gonna say interest rates to production of oil and uh, if, they, if they weighed in on interest rates right that would be interesting <laughs> they, may. they react so, to interest rates yeah. <laughs> we'll have, you know have the fed and opec switch rules someday just for fun so uh yeah no change in oil production um so they could you know and then that means other factors demand things like that if there is more conflict there um maybe uh, you know weather could have an impact if we start to see an early hurricane season so it does you know look like oil is going to be holding pretty steady at least for now um so we'll continue to watch that but the prices are still high um the biden administration is going to be releasing some gas uh, from reserves in the Northeast that maybe will help a little bit, but that hasn't really shown up too much yet in gas prices. Last question, Jane. Um, I, I read an article this week that said that people consider going out for fast food now a luxury. Yeah. The prices, uh, I think McDonald's and others have tried to bring some prices down. I think they had their $5, I'm just picking on McDonald's, but they have like a $5 yes. menu now. But uh -huh. many Americans still... You know, the inflation may have cooled in some places, but we all need to eat. Well, right. And uh, McDonald's, by the way, just this week said their average menu item has gone up 40% mm -hmm. since 2019. And that was in response to reports that it had gone up 100%. So the head of the McDonald's USA division was like, no, it's only 40%, which is still a lot of inflation. And I have, you know, I did this report for a lot of my local TV stations, and I've had more than one of them say, I'm noticing this. Like they were shocked at the bill that they got at a fast food restaurant. So, and this is one of the things that, you know, Americans eat for, you know, quick, cheap, easy. Um, but if it gets to be too expensive, I mean, it's just one of those other places inflation is showing up. Now, as you mentioned, McDonald's coming out with a, a cheaper meal, Burger King, I think Wendy's is coming out. So we'll see if that eases things a little bit. I think Americans, you know, I can't speak for everybody. I can only speak for myself, but I think I recognize the prices that have gone up. Um, I've tried to curtail, my wife and I have tried to curtail our consumption of certain things and and pivot. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that that is a strain 
on Americans. And I wonder, Jane, just last question, you know, the consumer sentiment, I think maybe a little dampened a little bit. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, well, I think so. Although it's been down for three months in a row, the most recent reading was a little bit better than expected. Um, doesn't mean it's great, um, but it was a little better than expected. But a lot of that had to do with the job market, not so much inflation. Inflation was still an issue. So it was more the tight job market that people felt better about. So inflation is still lurking. It's still out there. People are talking about it and it's an issue. Yeah. And, and I'll just say as my personal opinion, you know, when they do these sentiments and these polls, I have never been polled in my 52 years of existence. <laughs> I don't know who they talk to. I don't know how they ask the questions, but you yeah. know, is that really a um, a sample of the American population? You wonder. I mean, it's like, have you or anybody you know ever been asked? I mean, I have like, never been asked. Not to go no. off on a tangent, but I, in terms of polling, I've never been asked for my opinion. My wife doesn't even ask my opinion, Jane. So <laughs> uh, she just tells me what the opinion should be. Jane, yeah. we're going to have to leave it there. It's always great to see you. Thanks so much for joining Thanks. us, and we look forward to having you back again next okay. week. See you next week. Thanks, Jane. Great to see you. Thanks for sharing your perspective. And when we come back, we take a look back at some of our best segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts, so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Welcome back. It was another great week of shows with great topics and of course, great guests. We kicked off the week with a look at the age of cars on American roads. Let's take a look. Yeah, I think I read the same article. It's, 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 if I'm right, it's about 12 years now. And really, I think it comes down to, I mean, even though, you know, the consumer is still spending, those are big ticket items. And I mean, you and I have a mutual friend who, uh, just went to renew his lease and, and it went from 300 to 600 and he was in a bit of sticker shock there, you know? So, uh, you know, cars have gotten more expensive and for those that, you know, maybe were fortunate enough to buy a car that's still in good enough shape that they do the cost benefit analysis and they say, I, I, I think my old car is good for another year or two. Uh, my son has a friend who he won't change lanes unless his car tells him there's no one in the blind spot. He doesn't like to turn his head. Uh, and I'm from the older generation where you just have a mirror and you turn your head, you know, not relying on uh, sensors. But, you know, it's, it's a different generation. But, you know, one of the reasons the police no longer drive Crown Victorias is because Ford thought it was going to be too much to update the uh, sensors and the electronics and the anti-lock braking systems to meet the current safety standards. So you haven't seen some of some of those old. I mean, it, your, your point is true. Um, new cars have a lot more features to which make it uh, more convenient and safer for the average uh, driver. It stands to reason it's more expensive for a newer car because the residual or the replacement value is a lot higher. An older car, the insurance company can just total it out, so to speak. And then a newer car, I mean, parts are parts, unfortunately, are more expensive today, uh, given the uh, the nature of the environment we're in. I'm right near the. It's, I, I forgot the name, but basically it's a place where they train seeing eye dogs here in Morristown, New Jersey. And the electric cars are just quieter. I mean, the dogs can probably see them, but if you're used to listening to an internal combustion engine, that sound is not there. And what I think the study you're referring to talks more about in an urban environment. So where there's mm -hmm. a lot more background noise or this kind of drone or din or white noise versus, I mean, my neighbor has an electric car. And I hear him running over acorns before I see the car. So, you know, you might not have that advantage in, in the city, so to speak. So, I mean, I use no, my noise canceling headphones for calls. They're really good, but they do block out a lot of noise. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times when I'm getting uh, information from my wife, I just can't hear it because I'm wearing my noise canceling <laughs> headphones. Is that selective, Ray? It's a nice feature sometimes. <laughs> Next up, we discuss the successes of the U.S. retirement system. Let's take a look. 
Yeah, you're right. This is the 50 year anniversary of ERISA. And I think there's a lot to celebrate since the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974 was signed into law. Uh, so when it was signed into law, uh, defined benefit plans were really the more dominant uh, plan type. Uh, the 401k system didn't really come into existence until 1978 and has grown pretty remarkably since then. So if you look from a coverage perspective, roughly about 115 million Americans are covered by a DC uh, plan uh, today. Uh, by comparison, only 32 million are covered by defined benefit plans. And DC has provided a lot of benefit to a lot of people uh, in, in a lot of ways. Now, you mentioned the word ecosystem. I'm glad that you did that because people don't always think of it that way. But uh, the DC system and Social Security really coexist. And if you think about it, the lower wage workers have a much higher percentage of their wages that are covered by Social Security. But as you move up the pay scale, uh, that replacement comes more and more from defined contribution assets. Uh, according to the ICI, the combination of DC and Social Security, when you account for taxes, cover roughly around 90% of the average worker's uh, uh, income, which we think is really important. Uh, and again, it's all about that ecosystem and how those two uh, systems work together to provide retirement coverage. Last thing I would mention is that the DC system has done a lot for the middle class. So if you look at what um, where middle class savings have gone, a lot of that benefit has come through the DC system. So just one uh, statistic, and this is from the Federal Reserve, roughly about three quarters of the total financial assets of middle income families are invested in retirement accounts. That compares to only less than a third for the top 10% of the earners in the country. Uh, it's really done a lot. Uh, we think there's a lot to celebrate. Obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, th and thanks for having me, Jeff. Thanks for the question. Thinking broadly, there are two innovations that have driven improvements in the 401k. Uh, one is the ongoing enhancements to the system through a tremendous partnership between industry and policymakers. This is the greatest public-private partnership in America today. And then secondly, it's the ongoing investment and innovation that have created plans that have evolved with the workplace. So a couple of examples for you. Auto features that came in the 2006 Pension Protection Act. Every study that I've seen show the effectiveness of auto enrollment, auto escalation, and frankly, the automatic deferrals of money from paychecks directly into retirement accounts. Along the way, we've brought investment innovations such as target date funds and advice products that are essential based on the combination of technology and positive policy. Features like participant portals and income projections have also proven to be a tremendous innovation. As for plan formation advancements, it started with single employer plans and they've evolved to multiple employer plans, professional employer organizations, and most recently pooled empl employer plans, all addressing the coverage gap. So evolving demands from plan sponsors and plan participants have led to advancements from third-party administrators who are those plan design experts in our ecosystem, as well as outsourced fiduciaries such as 338s and 321s and 316s. Lastly, the continuing increase, or the, I'm sorry, the continuing increasing demand for advice, which brings personalization and customization to American savers who need it. But my point, Jeff, is it's a combination of technology and policy that have driven us to where we are now. And this combination will lead us into the future. Yeah. And, and Joe, I'm, I'm sorry. One more point I wanted to get in there, Jeff, is a new trend that we're seeing is that combination is driving us into being able to create new plans for smaller employers, which will help us close that access gap. So the future's bright. Well, Jeff, it's, it's always great to be here. And our system and I'm glad that Joe mentioned innovation, and I'm also glad that Michael mentioned the, the, the start of the 401k back in 1978. Our system is best described as a, as, as a retirement plan innovation that later gets codified into law or regulations. Our, our entire system really is like a large lab where ideas are tested, and then the best ones become common practice. So you know, uh, Michael mentioned that 1978 was the time when 401ks came into to play. But most people don't realize that back is in the late 60s, long before there was a thing called a 401k plan, Xerox Corporation developed a plan that had all of the attributes of a 401k plan. 
And then years later, as we look back, we're amazed at how powerful that idea really was. Um, later, plan sponsors started to experiment with auto features, like um, uh, Joe just said. Um, and then as recently as a, a number of years ago, Abbott Labs was pushed uh, pushed this idea for student loan repayments to be part of their uh, their retirement plan and secure uh, the secure 2.0 legislation said, hey, that's a great idea. Let's make it available for all plans. So our system really is a growing, adapting and living system that changes to meet the needs of our changing workplace. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to? Drop us a line and don't forget for all the latest curated news in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more in all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, then visit our website. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN Sunday. We'll be back with the Legal Eagles, David Levine and Kevin Walsh from Groom Law Group, and then Oliver Rennick of the Schwab Network will hear as well to help break down markets. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe. Keep on saving. Don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device.